You are tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. It's the first day of autumn, my favorite season, so I'm a happy camper today. It's Tuesday, September 22nd. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get to the updates and today's interview with UC Davis Chancellor Gary May, let me pause to wish KDRT a very happy birthday. September 24th marks 16 years since we started KDRT, which early on I dubbed as the little radio station that could. Though classified as a low-power FM station, KDRT's impact locally has been anything but small. It's been my privilege to steer the Davis Media Access ship, including KDIRT, for many years and also to hop in the host seat six months ago to bring you this program. So if this show has been useful to you on any level, please consider making a donation this week to support the work we do here. Because the truth is, community radio doesn't happen without community support. Learn more at kdrt.org and thank you. And here are some COVID updates for our area. The adjusted case rate in Yolo County dropped from over 9 per 100,000 residents last week and to 7.5 this week, continuing a downward trend in cases over the last two weeks. However, public health officials urge caution, saying Yolo County remains at least two weeks away from moving out of the state's purple tier for counties with widespread risk of COVID-19 transmission. In order to move to the red tier, which would allow a number of Yolo County businesses, including gyms, libraries, nail salons, movie theaters, and places of worship to reopen, albeit with restrictions on the number of people allowed in at a time, The county's daily case rate must go below 7 and remain there for at least two weeks. In addition to having a daily case rate below 7 per 100,000 residents, a county must also have a test positivity rate below 8% in order to move from Tier 1 to Tier 2. The return of thousands of UC Davis students in the next week, many of whom will be screened by the university for COVID-19 upon arrival, could make that difficult if the increased testing results in a higher daily case rate for the county as a whole. And we'll have more on that later with our guest. Meanwhile, Yolo Public Health is offering free corona. Uh, COVID-19 testing at various locations in Yolo County during the latter half of September. Uh, That's us now through the end of September 30th. That will provide greater accessibility to testing. The specific testing site dates and locations are spread across Yolo County with locations in Clarksburg, Dunnigan, Esparto, West Sacramento, and Woodland. Proof of residency is required. I'm going to give you the website for registration. You must pre-register. I'm then going to direct you to the yolocounty.org webpage to to capture it. It's avalincoronatest.com slash patient, A-V-E-L-L-I-N, coronatest.com slash patient. In addition to those sites uh, provided by the county, the state of California's free OptumServe test site remains open at the Davis Senior Center through September 30th, and that's at 646A Street in Davis. An important note on this site is that it's open to all California residents, regardless of documentation status, and it's by appointment only, and all ages are welcome. To schedule, call 888-634-1123 or go online at lhi.care. We're going to take a moment for music, and we will be back with our interview shortly. Okay, my guest today is Gary S. May, who became UC Davis's seventh chancellor in 2017. He leads the most comprehensive campus in the University of California system with four colleges and six professional schools. The numbers are kind of staggering. UC Davis enrolls more than 39,000 students, brings in nearly $850 million annually in sponsored research, and contributes $8 billion annually to California's economy. It's an institution that brought many alums, like yours truly, to Davis and helped us find a home and make a difference locally. 
This week, UC Davis was once again rated among the top colleges in the country in the latest Best Colleges Rankings by UC Davis News and <laughs> by US News and World Report, which ranked UC Davis the 11th best public school in the United States and the 39th best school overall. Quite an accomplishment. Welcome to you, Chancellor May, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Autumn. Thanks for having me. You bet. Well, to start, my impression of you is that you're a very outgoing and community-oriented leader. So I'm guessing that that's brought its own uh, challenges in this pandemic. How are you and your family doing? Well, the family's doing well, uh, as can be expected. You know, like all families, this has been a bit of a trying time. My wife actually lost her aunt uh, to the virus back in March. Mm. Um, but, you know, and we all feel kind of isolated. and That's the daily interaction of people uh, around the campus and the community. Uh, we're missing football these yeah. days and uh, all those sort of things. Yeah. Well, over the summer, you hired um, a new provost and executive vice chancellor, which is a big deal. And she yeah. happens to be an epidemiologist. Is her background a happy coincidence uh, or, or was that by design? Uh, please tell us about her role on campus. Yeah, that was just uh, my amazing foresight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Her name is Mary Krogan. Uh, Mary is our new provost and executive vice chancellor. She does happen to be an epidemiologist, which really was just a, a happy accident. Mm -hmm. uh, she's actually served 30 years in the, in the University of California. Uh, she was a UCSF faculty member. She was system-wide academic senate chair. She worked at the office of the president. But most recently, she came to us from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where she was uh, vice president for research. And um, she is an Aggie herself. Uh, uh, she got her um, uh, BS uh, from UC Davis uh, uh, in community health. Nice. And she's an Aggie parent. Several of her children have been uh, Aggies. The one I think is still currently an Aggie. Great. Um, Keeping it in the family. <laughs> yeah, she's been terrific. She's been a great addition to our leadership team. Her, her insight is, is invaluable, and she works very well with all of us. Well, congratulations on that. So when you run an institution as big as UC Davis, you obviously deal with challenges on a large scale as well. So who advises you on the pandemic? Uh, well, there's no shortage of advice for the chancellor. I give it <laughs> all, all sorts of ways. Um, but uh, in terms of who I regularly work with and listen to, uh, you know, public health officials, uh, our elected leaders, uh, experts from across our campus, uh, all help me to make the decisions we need to make. Um, uh, you know, we, we used that input to decide when we were going to uh, suspend operations as well as our gradual return to operations. And we, we put all that into a, a website, uh, a Campus Ready website, mm -hmm. campusready.ucdavis.edu, if people are interested. Okay. Uh, we also share a weekly uh, uh, email update uh, uh, that goes out to the campus community, uh, ch checking in with Chancellor May. And I'm very active on social media, so uh, I'm, I'm putting information out. I'm, I'm receiving a lot of feedback on social media as well. Great. And you're right on the cusp of a, a very big week with, what, some 24,000 students um, expected to be living here fall quarter, right. which starts right. starts next week. Right. And... Um, I know the vast majority of students here in Davis live in apartments and single-family homes. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, can you tell us about the plans for testing students when they arrive and then on an ongoing basis? Yeah, sure. Uh, of those 24,000, actually 11,000 of them were already here and okay. living in the, in, the, in the community. Uh, and the rest are arriving this week. Um, I'm actually really proud of the teamwork that we've uh, been able to establish between the city in the county and the university to manage the pandemic. You know, we have this initiative we're calling Healthy Davis Together, mm -hmm. which you may have heard about or read about. And that's really a, a cooperative initiative between the university and the city to reduce the spread of, of COVID-19 in the community. And um, a, part of it, a big part of it is the testing that we're going to be doing on campus. We actually started the testing um, last week. I, I did the testing myself. Mm -hmm. It was um, high throughput saliva-based uh, PCR test, so not the nasal swab, but you just spit into a tube, and, and, and the results are available in 24 hours. Mm. Uh, and right now, we're just validating that with, with the nasal swab test to, to make sure that we're getting accurate results. And once we've finished the validation pilot, we'll be ready to do the mass, uh, mass throughput, which will be able to test thousands of students per day, or thousands of people per day. 
Um, uh, we've already tested more than a thousand of the students who are moving into the to the uh, housing campus housing um, with very limited uh, positives. I think only one positive that I'm aware of. Right. In talking with public health officials at the county, there's, you know, the unknown is when you obviously when you bring in an influx of of people who haven't been in community for a while, it, it, we'll have to watch for a couple of weeks and see how things develop if cases go go up or not. I think the harder question and and I think this is a hard question because I don't know what authority the university has to um I'm going to use the word enforce <laughs> um, yeah. for for students who who are living off campus in congregate settings. I'm trying very hard not to pick on the Greek system, but I'm going to use them as an example. Um, yeah. when, when people tend to gather, if they gather, will there be any consequences for that? That is to say, if they gather in a way that is not compliant with current public health guidelines. Yeah, so um, I'll get to the enforcement issue in just a second. I want to start by saying we're looking at this as an a educational and developmental opportunity rather than a sure. uh, way to punish people. And so we've hired 250 students to be what we're calling public health ambassadors. Hmm. Um, and those will be peer uh, ambassadors for their others, uh, for those other students who will you know, remind people to wear their masks if they've forgotten them or, or keep six feet apart and you know, wash their hands and all those sort of things that we're used to hearing now, and um, the idea is that they'll be better messaged from them than from the administration mm -hmm. saying what to do and what not to do, and um, uh, there, yes, there will be uh, a series of uh, progressive consequences for people who don't behave properly up to and including suspension and expulsion, but we hope we don't get that far, Right. Um, but there are new policies in place, and we've already codified the policies, so the students are aware of them. The students are taking a pledge to behave properly as part of their uh, return to campus and, and their orientation for the new students. So um, we're trying to do the best we can with uh, uh, just messaging and, and you know, um, uh, communication of what's good behavior rather than being heavy-handed with it. Right. Right. Sounds like a good plan. I know a lot of us are, you know, having students here in town is, is uh, I'm going to say it's a, a mixed bag. All of a sudden town is more crowded and people are learning how to ride bikes in traffic and, you know, all of that. But right. but students support the local economy and the business in a profound way. And so I think yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of hope about them coming back and about, you know, helping keep our businesses alive. Yeah, so. that's why the uh, Healthy Davis Together is so important. We have to be partners in this. We want the students to behave properly. We want uh, the businesses to be uh, open and available and have the right sort of uh, uh, safe environment for people to, to uh, uh, be patrons. And uh, uh, I think, you know, it's a win-win if we can do it together. Sure. And, of course, I'm sure you've been watching the news elsewhere in the country where colleges have and universities have opened without these kind of precautions in place, and it's not been a good outcome. Yeah, and one advantage to being on quarters, uh, starting so late, is we get to kind of observe what everyone else has done, mm -hmm. try not to make the same mistake. So, uh, you know, our curriculum is going to be very limited in terms of in-person instruction. Only about 35 courses out of our 6,000 course fall curriculum mm -hmm. will be in person, and these will just be sort of laboratory performance studio kind of courses. Right. We have tents so the students can do those courses outside, which is a little bit safer, um, and um, uh, I think some of our peer institutions early on were a little bit more aggressive in their in-person instruction than we're going to be, mm -hmm. which, which led to some of the, uh, you know, some of the problems. Right, and and this is not a, a you know a short term solution. The latest news suggests that you know we'll be doing this all through the academic year. Do you think that's the case? I think we won't get back to a normal, uh, quote unquote, until probably next year. But I I hope that we can gradually, in a phased manner, get closer and closer to normal uh, throughout the year. So as the state goes from you know the county goes from purple to red to whatever the next color is, <laughs> and. Uh, we will, uh, uh, at the same time, be, uh, you know, uh, easing our restrictions as well and having yeah. more in-person classes and those sorts of things. Yeah, we've been stuck on red so long, I'm not sure there's anything past purple. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, obviously, UC Davis is, I mentioned this earlier, it's just a giant in our region in terms of its revenues and its employment. So I'm curious what impact the the disruption of the pandemic has had on on things like the university's um fundraising its staffing its support services just kind of in general yeah. terms well 
So there's good news and bad news there. Um, you know, the bad news was uh, obviously there was a tremendous financial hit to uh, the university when the pandemic started, mainly in the areas of housing and dining, because students went home and you know, we let them out of their housing contracts. Yeah. Um, and then in the medical center lost lots of revenue because of uh, not doing elective surgeries and that sort of things, only focusing on making room for uh, uh, virus patients mm-hmm. uh, in the ICU. And so um, we, we lost probably a total of $180 million or so uh, from March to, to June. Mm-hmm. Now, some of that was um, uh, uh, alleviated by the CARES Act. We got $34 million in CARES Act funds. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, still pretty significant losses. Um, and it's going to take us a while to come back. But, you know, I think we will bounce back because the, the fundamental business model is, is sound. So uh, as things return to normal, we'll, we'll, we'll recover. On the positive side, the university had record year in two categories. The fundraising, hmm. philanthropy, was uh, a record of $253 million last fiscal year from more than 30,000 donors. So I can't say enough about how proud I am of our community for stepping up and, and being generous to the university uh, under these circumstances. Hmm. And we also generated a record $941 million in research awards. Wow. And that was a hundred, nearly $100 million more than the previous record. So, so our faculty and our researchers are just going, uh, doing ex- exceptionally well uh, and doing the kind of important research that the country needs at this time. Right. That, those are some phenomenal numbers. I, I've actually interviewed some of your, your faculty, uh, virologists and epidemiologists, and so I know a little bit about this, but let, let's discuss about the role UCD is playing, um, particularly in the research and development of vaccines and other COVID-related research. Mm-hmm. Well, um, uh, we're trying to be part of the solution here. Uh, you know, uh, in the beginning of the, the pandemic, our, our school of medicine, veterinary medicine, our Center for Immunology and Infectious Diseases uh, all started collaborating on vaccines and diagnostic testing. We're, we're actually uh, participating in uh, clinical trials, I think, for two different vaccines. Mm-hmm. Um, you may remember the, the very first community spread patient uh, for, for COVID yes. landed at UC Davis Medical Center. Um, and so we were instrumental in getting the CDC to change testing protocols based on that experience. Hmm. Um, uh, we test and we, we treated that patient, uh, I believe, with uh, 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 remdesivir, if I'm not mistaken, which has become a, an important therapeutic for, for the disease. Um, and the, piece, the patient is fully recovered and, and, and home. Hmm. Uh, so that's a really good news story. Um, our College of Engineering is working with the School of Medicine on 3D printing test swabs and uh, working on producing ventilators. And we have communication experts that are analyzing social media as a way to track outbreaks. Um, uh, some pretty innovative work there. So all hmm. sorts of things going on to, to, again, be part of the COVID-19 solution. Wonderful. So. <laughs> One one of the other disruptions um, early in the pandemic was as construction came to a halt. You know, there were a lot of things going on. I know UCD has committed to building a lot of student housing, and much of that is quite visibly underway. I'm curious if the pandemic has has interrupted any of the long range development plan, or if things are you know on track to proceed. Unfortunately, nothing was interrupted. We are we are on track, maybe a little bit ahead. Uh, we. Uh, uh, opened up a thousand new beds in our uh, West Village development, um, and that's actually where I was helping students, uh, transfer students, and others move in last week. Nice. Um, we'll have another 2,300 beds by next academic year, so we are well on our way to to solving some of the housing issues that we've had uh, in the community for many years. So I'm I'm really happy about that. Great. Um, so I I'd like to. Um, I'd like to end on a note where we think about if you could if you could sit down one on one with an incoming UC Davis student, or if you could address the whole class that's coming in right now. What would your message be about about hope and about you know keeping on in this very weird year we're having? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I guess the first thing I would tell them is you've made a great choice when you're coming to UC Davis. You're going to be at a top ten or top five public university. 
uh, in the country, and you're going to get a great education that's going to prepare you for your career. Uh, you're also going to be at a place that cares about um, social mobility, and uh, you know, even though you may come from humble uh, beginnings, you know, many of our students are first generation or low income or mm -hmm. have other issues. You're going to have a transformative experience here that's going to propel you and your family to high quality of life. And we're going to try to instill in you um, some sense of uh, uh, responsibility for your fellow students, your fellow citizens, and your community, because we want our students to be leaders in their communities and in their jobs and be a force for positive change, uh, uh, social change, as they go out and leave us. So um, I think you'll, you'll also be able to still have a little fun. We're going to try to do what we can, do some programming, uh, socially distant and, and safe <laughs> programming for the students that are here. And over time, over the next several months and a couple of years, we'll, we'll get back to something close to normal. Yes, the, the phrase new normal has become, well, the new normal. <laughs> we, we all say it. We all find ourselves saying it. So I, yep. yeah, I, I really want to thank you for taking time to talk with us today. I want to let you know that you've been my most requested interview as I reached out to the community and said, who would you like to hear from? People really, oh, wow. yeah, people really wanted to hear from you because obviously UC Davis has, you know, big footprint in the community. And uh, I also want you to know, in your honor, my mask today is is Star Trek themed, and we're on, <laughs> we're on the radio, so I can't show you, but I I, I felt moved to wear it because I'm with you. <laughs> I have a couple of Star Trek masks myself. <laughs> All right, again, thank you so much for uh, participating in local community radio, and wishing you all the best as uh, the quarter kicks off. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You bet. Take care. Bye bye. That was Chancellor Gary May of UC Davis, and uh, we're going to take a little break for music and come back and chat a little bit more. All right, I always feel like I rush through the information I share about testing every week, so I am just going to share that one more time because it felt a little hurried earlier. Uh, so let's note that Yolo County Public Health is now offering free coronavirus screening, COVID-19 testing at various locations in Yolo County through September 30th. And to be clear, these are, uh, this is to see if you have COVID-19, it does not test for antibodies or, or anything else. And um, it's gonna be all over Yolo County throughout uh, the rest of the month with locations in Clarksburg, Dunnigan, Esparto, West Sacramento, and Woodland. And in some of those locations, you, you may uh, notice are pretty rural. They're in pretty small areas of the county. And I think this is really an attempt to make sure that everyone who needs testing is getting tested. Uh, so proof of residency is required. You have to live in Yolo County to access these. It's free. Registration is recommended in order to speed up the process, but they say it's not required and it doesn't guarantee a test. And also, when you register, you won't get any feedback. You won't get an email saying that you're registered and confirming your date. So I'm not sure what that's about. But again, the link for that is avalinocoronatest.com slash patient. All lowercase, and Avellino is spelled A-V-E-L-L-I-N-O, Avellino Corona Test. And then, of course, again, through um, the state of California, they, they maintain the free OptumServe test site uh, open at the Davis Senior Center at 646 A Street in Davis. And that's uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. through the end of the month. This one is open to all California residents, regardless of documentation documentation status, and it is also by appointments only. Interestingly enough, none of the other sites say this. All ages are welcome at this one. Um, and it's at the Senior Center, so that's very inclusive of them. To schedule an appointment for this site only, you can call 888-634-1123, or you can go online to lhi.care. I am going to sign off for today. I'm excited next week uh, to bring Jesse Salinas, who is among many roles he plays, a class, uh, assessor, clerk, recorder, um, and elections uh, head at the county. And we're going to talk about how the pandemic has changed how we vote in this most pivotal 
uh, an important election year. So signing off from the KDRT studio, this is Autumn Labbe Renault. You've been listening to the COVID-19 Community Report.